Bible reading. So Philippians 2, 1 to 4. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Anyone else? Yeah, come on then, David. Okay, and we've got one more tray if anyone else wants to. No? All right, okay. Well, we'll come back to that later on this morning. Um, and uh, you'll see the relevance of me giving out some bits of... Uh, Lego to people in a moment or two. If we could have the first slide up, please, Paul. I haven't got the clicker today, so I'm going to have to rely on that. It's on the Easy Worship, I think. Second slide there. Third slide. Thank you. Right. Okay. So let us think about this uh, passage that Taryn read to us earlier this morning, that if we keep Jesus in focus in our lives, if we keep Jesus at the center, thank you, of our lives, if we are seeking first his righteousness um, and his kingdom, if we're following the narrow way, you know, these are things that we've been looking at this year, if we're putting Jesus in the driving seat of our lives, making him number one, then, then we will know encouragement, comfort, fellowship, and tenderness and compassion. Because what this passage is telling us is that actually, you know, when you put Jesus first, all these other things slot into place. And it happens because Christ is who he is. We've just been thinking about some of the attributes of Jesus as we've been looking at the communion this morning. They happen because of what he has done for us. They happen because he is at work in our lives. They happen because he has placed us amongst other Christians who share our beliefs. So that is why we can know encouragement, comfort, fellowship, tenderness, <coughs> and compassion. And what this verse 1 says to us is, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. We are united with Christ. Why are we united with Christ? Because we share in the one body of Christ. That's what we've just been doing there. That's why we have bread that we break open in front of you. Because we are sharing that one body. 
You and I are joined to Jesus. You and I are walking uh, with him. You and I are sharing in his death and his resurrection. You and I are sharing in his resurrection blessings. You and I are sharing in his resurrection power. You and I are sharing in his resurrection promises. Jesus has declared that you and I are a new creation. That we've been born again, not of the flesh, but born in a spiritual way. And Jesus has said that anyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the rich inheritance that you and I share in. So we share in Christ, in these rich things. So when Paul says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, they're the sort of things that we need to be thinking about. Rather than just thinking, oh, isn't life bad? Isn't life terrible? Yes, it might well be bad around us, but you and I have one that we serve who is greater than all those things. And I want to ask you this morning, as you sit here this morning, do you know, you know, is that a reality for you? Do you know the encouragement of being united with Christ? Have you invited Jesus into your heart and made him the center? Or as we were thinking about uh, several weeks ago at our building block church, has he become out of focus for you and you need to refocus on Jesus. So that's the first thing. Second thing that he says is if there is any comfort from the, his love. I don't know if you, about you, but have you ever been in love? I'm trying really hard not to look at somebody this morning. <laughs> but have you ever been in love? All right. Do you remember those times when you were in love? And it was like your heart was fit to bursting because of ha the strength of feelings that you had for that other person. And, uh, it, you know, when you were with them, your heart was pounding. And it was like it was going to burst because there was such a strong feeling within you for that other person. And every moment that you spent with that other person was, uh, was like being on a mountaintop. It was like being at the top, you know, of, of a wonderful experience. That is just a, you know, a, a, a small glimpse of what it's like when we talk about the love of God for us. I don't know whether you've ever thought about this, but God's heart is bursting in the same way that your heart bursts uh, for the love of somebody else, but a thousand times, maybe a million times stronger than, than the love that we can ever have. <coughs> That is the love that God has for each one of us. And it's interesting because the word that is used there is a word that some of us know. It's a word called agape. It's a, it's, it's a Greek word that means love. But it means a specific type of love. It means a love that is full of faithfulness, a love that is full of commitment, and a love that is an act of will. So God is saying to each one of us, yeah, I love you because I choose to love you. I love you because I, I, I want to be, I'm a faithful God. I'm faithful <coughs> to all the promises that I've made. And when we think about, you know, th this amazing thing, this almighty God, this all-knowing God, this all-powerful God, this God who is in heaven, and he loves you. Each one of us. And he knows everything about us. And he knows when we mess up and when, he, when we fall down and when we don't get quite right, and when our heart attitude isn't quite love right. And he says, I still love you. And so that's why we read in this part of the passage, you know, about... Um, being comforted by God's love. And 
as I was preparing this, I was thinking, I don't know, maybe there's some of you this morning that are, are thinking, <coughs> you know, I just, I, I just need to experience afresh the love of God. And so I'm just going to invite you now just to close your eyes with me. And uh, if you want to put your hands out like, like I'm doing, uh, to receive again the love of God. Holy Spirit, Father, Lord Jesus, please will you pour down afresh your love for us. Would you just give us a fresh revelation of how much we are loved by you? Would you draw near to us now so that we can know that love that you have for us? So we are united with Christ. We share in his love. And then the third thing it says, and if the, therefore if any of you have any fellowship or some ver versions of the Bible, depending on which, uh, how modern your translation is, it seems to be, it says some have common sharing in the spirit or fellowship in the spirit. And you see, part of this is that as followers of Jesus, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who is at work in us and is, is working through us as well. And it's the Holy Spirit who is filling us and goes on filling us with his presence. And it's not a different spirit that is in you that is in me. It's the same Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings unity to the body of Christ not disunity you know think about it for a moment if it's the same Holy Spirit if I can just use my wife as an example <coughs> Helen's full of the Holy Spirit I pray that I'll be I am full of the Holy Spirit as well it's the same Holy Spirit so when Helen and I are debating in a very uh, heated way some theological matter okay <laughs> And she's saying, no, I'm right. And she, I'm saying, no, I'm right. Well, one of us is wrong, aren't we? Because it's the same Holy Spirit in us. And so what's happening there is that our will is overriding the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit's not going to be saying one thing to Helen and a different thing to me. He is the Holy Spirit that is going to be saying the same thing. And so when it talks about unity in the church, we need to remember that it is the same Holy Spirit. And so if there is disagreement on some matter within the church, one of us, or perhaps both of us, are not hearing correctly from the Holy Spirit. So let's just think about this for a moment or two then. So being united with Christ being comforted by, by the love of God and, being and having fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Did you spot it? United with Christ because we share in all that he's done for us. This leads to being comforted by the love of the Father and we fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It's the Trinity, isn't it? It's the Trinity. And so Paul, right at the start of this second chapter, is talking about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, back to our Lego. How are we getting on? How are we getting on over here? <coughs> oh, yeah, we've got a, a person, yes. And what have we got here? We've got a, a nice little house, yes. Prison cell. Prison cell and, uh, oh, David's done the cross there. Brilliant, yeah, brilliant. Carry on, carry on enjoying it. Now, the thing is that... <coughs> Lego, Lego is a bit like people in a church because there are certain things that link Lego together. That wasn't meant to be a pun. It just came out that way. Sorry about that. Okay? If you think about Lego, it, they, it, Lego has to follow certain rules. Okay? First of all, it has to follow the rule of ratio. So this little single block here 
That is the basic Lego block. And anything else is a multiple of that. So this one here is a times eight multiple. This one's times four and so on like that. Can you see that it, the ratio is absolutely important? Secondly, the material that it's made from, all Lego is made from plastic. It's a, a plastic called acronitrile butadiene styrene, ABS. Okay, and the reason I know that is because I'm a design technology teacher. <laughs> Thirdly, it is made by injection molding. It's m the plastic is forced into a mold there. Fourthly, it has studs on the top and it has holes underneath. And if you made something that uh, was supposedly Lego and it didn't follow those rules, it wouldn't work. Now the great thing is, is that you can pick up bits of Lego and so at the beginning of the service today, I took a um, jug of Lego and gave it to different people and that and said, make something out of it. Fully confident that they could join bits together and make something because there were common things there. And what Paul is saying in this passage here today is that we are like bits of Lego. We're not all the same. Some of you are a, a red eight stud piece of Lego. Some of you are a flat strip piece of Lego with six studs on. Some of you are a four stud blue piece of Lego. Some of you are <coughs> have studs both on the top and on the side. We're all different. But it is the, the things that we, Paul was talking about in that first chapter that unites us together. They're like the, the common attributes of the church. And they allow the church to come together and to be joined together. Now, Paul is he, he, he's realistic. And he knows that there's going to be times when it doesn't quite work out right. And that there are uh, arguments and disagreements. Just fast forward, not now, but you know when you get home, Fast forward to chapter 4, and you can see the disagreements that were happening there. But what Paul says is, he's saying, look, I long to see the church joined together, just like the bits of Lego that are being joined together here. I long to see that unity in the church. He longs to see that the church functioning in a world which is broken around us bringing light and life and hope and joy. And, you know, our prayers this Christmas time is that we can be a good news church. We can be people that are proclaiming the good news. <coughs> because we know that there's something more to life. We've met Jesus. We've been encouraged by Jesus. You know, we're all different in a church, but there are things that unite us together. So there is Paul sitting in prison <coughs> with his chains on, and he says, do you know what would give me real joy? Do you know what would give me real, real joy at the moment? It's not to remove my change. It's not to be able to go out for a walk whenever I want to. It's not to be set free from this prisoner that is... Um, or not prisoner, but this guard that is sitting here right next to me all the time. That, that's, not, that's not what's going to give me joy. You know what's going to give me joy? It's hearing that the church is united. So, I'm just conscious of the time, so let's press on with this. So first, two, he, and he says, look, this is what will give me real joy. Look, I want to hear reports of you being like-minded. I want to hear reports of you having the same love. I want to hear reports of you being one in spirit. I want to hear stuff about you being one in purpose, being together and working for Jesus together as a church <coughs> and doing the things that God has called us to do. So how does this work out in a practical way, way? How does it actually work out? Well, Paul, in these verses, 
gives us a clue there because in the next two verses, three and four, he gives us a clue. <coughs> and it's all about our attitude. It's all about your attitude and my attitude. If I'm doing stuff uh, out of selfish ambition, and that can be an individual or it can be a group in the church saying, we, w we, want, we want to do stuff so that it, you know, we're built up so that we're made to feel special, so that we're, you know, praised and that sort of thing. If that's what we're doing, then we're getting it wrong. Or I want it all the focus to be on me. We were watching a um, video during the week of J. John, and he's talking about people looking in their navels uh, and it's uh, when you come to do that, it's worth watching because it's, it's a very amusing part of the video where he's looking at his navel all the time. That's what vain conceit is about, isn't it? You know, have you seen my navel? Have you seen how wonderful my navel is? Uh, have you, you know, I've got the most beautiful navel. <coughs> okay, vain conceit. It's about me, 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 me. And Paul's saying, I, that, that's not how it should be. Instead, it's about considering others better than yourselves. Just listen to some of the words that he puts in this passage. He says, do nothing. So what does that mean? Do something? No. It means nothing. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Nothing. That's, that's the power behind it. Nothing. Rather, or instead of, in humility, value others <coughs> above yourself. Value who? Others. Not some, but others. Value others above yourself. Not looking to your own in sorry, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. That's that's not saying, you know, don't look after yourself. It, it, Paul's not saying that. He said, but look, look to the interests of others as well. Putting other people first. Helping other people instead of you. I was thinking, I don't know what your routine is on a Sunday morning when you get ready to come along here on a Sunday morning. Get up maybe, get yourself dressed, make sure you've got your, you know, your Sunday best on. I've got, my, I've got my Christmas jumper on. I sort of put that on because it's the first Sunday of Advent and that. Make sure a clean handkerchief with you. Have you got a clean hanky today? Yeah, good. Um, make sure that you've cleaned your teeth. Make sure that you've done all those things. Make sure that you've got your Bible with you so that you can follow the sermon and all those things as well. But can I just suggest that there maybe is one other thing that you could do on a Sunday morning? Because there's been two words that I've missed out of the, uh, the talk this morning. And those two words are tenderness and compassion. Because Paul is saying, look, in all of this, put on tenderness and compassion. So when you put your, your, your clothes on on Sunday morning, come to along to the church here, maybe put on some tenderness as well. I'm not saying that you're not a tender church. So that I shouldn't have said it quite in that way, but... <laughs> You, you understand what I mean, yeah? Yeah, putting on tenderness, putting on compassion, yeah. And, uh, you know, having those things, maybe even making yourself a little badge and uh, just to remind yourself about putting on tenderness and compassion. We all need to do it. So that we can serve one another, preferring the needs of one another. So Paul wrote, therefore, if any if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. And I hope you do have encouragement from being united with Christ. If you have any comfort from his love, remember how much God loved you. If you have any fellowship with the Holy Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, 
having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Paul then goes on and says, now let's think about Jesus. And let's think about how Jesus worked that out. And that's what we're going to be doing next Sunday. Bless you. Thank you. <coughs> I'd like to bring them up and to the front to put them so that we can all appreciate your creative skills. <laughs>